Man is least himself when he talks in his own person. Give him a mask and he will tell you the truth. Oscar Wilde. Violent Vice contains graphic and explicit content, which may not be suitable for some listeners. Listener discretion is advised. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Violent Vice. My name is Audie Griffith. And I'm John John. Hello. If you guys could do us a favor, hit that subscribe button, leave us a five-star review, and write a review. We'd really, really appreciate it. It really helps us move up the charts and get noticed by more people like you. So, I got a couple doozies coming up and in the works, and today is... One that's called the Black Dahlia. See, anything that you've told me so far with the term black in their names has given me nightmares. Audie, <laughs> give me any. Well, I mean, this is a gruesome crime, but the Black Dahlia was named the Black Dahlia more on her looks than anything she did. So Okay, so you're saying there's hope that I won't have nightmares from this? There is. And oh, good. actually researching this topic led me on a couple rabbit holes, so to speak. And that's how I came up with next week's topic. Um so this should be pretty pretty interesting. Okay. I do like rabbit holes. They are fun. But I don't know. A bit spooky, Audie. Yeah, well, I mean, these are just, uh, like, I mean, murders and, and or serial killers, so we'll kind of get into it. So less spooky, more just uncomfortable or unsettling? Yes. Also a wonderful feeling, I guess. Yeah. No, no, no it's not. Well, who is this Black Dahlia? So, her name was Elizabeth Short. She was nicknamed the Black Dahlia after her murder. She Elizabeth Short was an aspiring actress and was brutally murdered in Los Angeles, California. She was found with her body cut in half and severely mutilated. Her body was found on January 15, 1947, in a vacant lot near Lemerit Park. The Black Dahlia's killer was never officially found, though there is a pretty convincing suspect um, that most people, I guess, blame for her murder. And it also, with no official suspect, this makes her murder one of the oldest cold case files in L.A. to date, as well as the city's most famous. So Elizabeth Short was born on July 29, 1924, in Boston, Massachusetts. She was the third of five daughters born to Cleo and Phoebe May Sawyer Short. Cleo abandoned the family when Short was five years old, and at a young age, Short developed a strong affinity for the cinema. By her teens, she had set her sights on becoming an actress. By the mid-1940s, Short was living in Los Angeles, California, working as a waitress to support herself while dreaming of catching her big break in Hollywood's acting scene. Her chance at stardom, however, would never come. In January 1947, a horrific tragedy occurred. At the age of just 22, Short was brutally murdered in Los Angeles. She was found by a um, mother and daughter who were on their way to repair some shoes at a shoe shop in a vacant lot. And like I said earlier, her body was cut in half and severely mutilated. So it does cause nightmares. Well, I mean, her it was a bloody gruesome murder, but mm-hmm. yeah. But yeah, that child definitely had nightmares. Yes. So... It- so yes, that does cause nightmares. Okay, but the funny thing was is after the mother like went to a neighbor to call the police, she left to go repair her shoes. She didn't really stick around too too much. So apparently it happened often in this area cuz I feel like you would want to, you know, know what's going on, but I guess she had stuff to I do. I mean, clinging to normalcy after seeing that, I wouldn't say is unusual. 
a little on the cold side, but also if they did need to get repairing their shoes, say it was their only ones, I get it. Because obviously there's problems in the area. Bad yeah. shoes means you could trip, fall, problems. Yeah. So maybe safety was on their mind, but that is giving a lot of benefit of the doubt there. Yep. So again, this is a little bit reiterative, but um, so... Again, her body was found cut in half, severely mutilated. It was found nude and posed by the local female resident on January 15th, 1947, in a vacant lot near the Limerick Park on the 300, or 3800 block of LA's South Norton Avenue. It was pretty gruesome. Brian Carr, a detective with the Los Angeles Police Department who has long worked on the Dahlia case, said, I just can't imagine somebody doing that to another human being. In addition to dissecting and mutilating her body, Short's killer had also drained her corpse of blood and scrubbed it clean. The case quickly became heavily covered in the media. Her moniker, Black Dahlia, became widely known shortly thereafter, and it was used more frequently than her real name by the press. The case itself took on a life of its own, Carr said. Early on, I think for the two months, it was front page news every day in local papers all the time. Um, an in-depth, lengthy investigation by the LAPD ensued, leading to a number of false reports, including several false murder confessions and ultimately leading detectives grasping at straws. The sole witness of the murder had reported seeing a black sedan parked in the area in the early morning hours, but could not provide police with anything else. The combination of faulty witnesses and lack of hard evidence surrounding the case greatly hindered its progress, and despite numerous allegations and leads over the years, the Black Dahlia's killer was never found. Today, the Black Dahlia murder remains one of the oldest cold case files in LA, as well as the city's most famous. So, case developments. In early 2013, the Black Dahlia case returned to the headlines. An article in San Bernardo Sun detailed a more recent investigation of the case that was conducted by a retired police sergeant, Paul Dosti, author Stephen Hodell, and a police dog named Buster, with a keen sense of smell, specifically that of decomposing flesh, which he was trained to detect. According to The Sun, the vesting... Uh, 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 Buster was on the case? Yeah, Buster, the police <laughs> dog. So a retired policeman... Yep. An author. Yep. Steve Hodel. Is was the dog a, re, a retired police dog? Nope. He was a current police dog named Buster. This sounds like the weirdest yet most amazing grouping of crime fighters ever. I know, right? This is so awesome. I love when police dogs <laughs> are in it. And like their names too are always so cool, like Buster and all that. Well, like, now that I'm thinking about it, like, the only one who actually had full authority at that time was the dog. Yeah. Because retired policemen shouldn't be doing the investigations for the case, and authors shouldn't have to do any of that. The dog's the only one who belongs there, so this is, this is amazing, Audie. Yeah. Is this going to be a TV show? Um, I think there's a couple movies on it, and oh. everything. <laughs> This oh. is great. Okay, yeah. yeah. No nightmares for me. This is too awesome to let go. Yeah, there's there's like a low budget movie on the Black Dahlia. I know from Amazon, and then there's a ton of uh, YouTube videos on it too. Oh man, this is great. Okay, good choice. I know, right? So, according to the Sun, the investigating team had uncovered incriminating evidence against Hodel's father. So Steve Hodel was the author but against his father, Dr. George Hill Holdell, who the younger Hodell has long believed to be the Black Dahlia killer. So the only thing I got to say is the son has reason to, I guess, hate his father and everything, and that's the most, I guess, contradicting of the evidence and uh, Dr. George Hill Hodel is one of the strongest suspects in the case, and we'll kind of get to why. I was a little bit joking about the TV show, but this sounds like a perfect TV show, Audie. Yeah. Like, father issues, a band of weird, yet all, like somehow finally working together group. The one who's... Oh, oh Audie. 
I can see it now. I know. I know. It's amazing. The, it's so filled with drama and it just gets more and more interesting. Oh, I have to. Oh, you, you're going to have to keep going. I'm going to go nuts over here, though. Okay. So in February 2013, the team conducted an extensive search of the doctor's home where Buster had previously detected the sign of human decomposition in several areas of the basement, according to reports. Following their search, soil samples taken from Dr. Hodel's home were reportedly submitted for lab testing. Other evidence against George Hodel, according to his son, includes an old recording of conversations between the doctor and, uh, and an unknown person, during which Dr. Hodel allegedly stated, Supposing I did kill the Black Dahlia, they couldn't prove it now. They can't talk to my secretary because she's dead. So, just, we'll get to it here in a minute, but George... Uh, this is so juicy. Yeah. This is so... Oh... So the LAPD did bug George's house, but George Hodel did have people on the inside, and the LAPD was notoriously corrupt at the time, too. So just letting you know why stuff wasn't strung together, th there are reasons. But this one this was confirmed with the LAPD that they had that recording. So oh, This has got to be an HBO show. Like nothing else. This is amazing, Audi. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Okay. And now a word from our sponsors. Do you guys like good quality clothing? And do you prefer the color of black? Well, you guys should check out ravenyx.com. That's R-A-V-E-N-Y-X.com. You'd be helping a small business, and they have a wide variety of clothing. Everything from sandals, boots, bags to dresses and skirts and tops i personally got their flowy top and i absolutely love it i'd recommend them highly you can use the code vilevice to get 40 percent off that's capital v i l e capital v i c e for 40 percent off now back to the show okay but i got a side ta tangent maybe i won't um do you remember, like, when you were in kindergarten, you gave yourself your own middle name because we thought your first name was just John John? Yes. I decided it was going to be Peter. John John Peter Griffith. <laughs> yep. That, I always remember that. And we got so mad because, like, when we got in trouble, it would be like, Audie Elizabeth or Gabrielle Rosemary, and then it was just John John, and we were like, what? <laughs> what <laughs> that's why i'm the favorite <laughs> yeah probably <laughs> i mean you are but <laughs> oh, okay <laughs> <laughs> all right okay we gotta get back to this juicy story because this is amazing yes yes okay so who is george hodel George Hill Hodel Jr. was born on October 10th, 1907, and raised in Los Angeles, California. His parents, George Hodel Sr., also, you know, someone named after himself, and Esther Hodel were of Russian Jewish ancestry. Their only son, he was well educated and highly intelligent, scoring 186 on early IQ tests. He is also a musical prodigy, playing solo piano concerts at Los Angeles' Shrine Auditorium. Composer Sergei Rachmaninoff traveled to his parents' house to hear the boy play. Hodel attended South Pasadena High School, graduated at age 15, and entered the prestigious California Institute of Technology, Caltech, in Pasadena. But he was forced to leave the university after one year due to a sex scandal involving a professor's wife, though this is not the only account of a sex scandal. He had wanted to impregnate the woman and wanted to raise their children together, but she refused. The oh. affair between Hodel and the woman caused her marriage to fall apart. Oh my gosh. He is just drama filled. Let me tell I you. No, this is like he's trying to form a cult at the same time. This is nuts. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. So, by around 1928, Hodel was in a common-law marriage with a woman named Amelia and had a son by her named Duncan. In 1930s, he was legally married to a model from San Francisco, Dorothy Anthony, and had a daughter with her named Tamara. 
Hotel graduated from Berkeley pre-med in June of 1932, and he immediately afterward enrolled in medical school at the University of California, San Francisco, and received his medical degree in June of 1936. After a success of his medical practice and becoming head of the County Social Hygiene Bureau, Hodel was moving in affluent Los Angeles society by the 40s. He was enamored with the darker side of surrealism and the decadence surrounding that art seat, befriending photographer Man Ray, a film director, John Hudson, and those associated with them. He and Ray and some other surrealists had shared an interest in sadomasochism and the darker side of art and uh, philosophy with the young men in the Hollywood scene. He shared a fondness for partying, drinking, and womanizing. Hodel's second legal wife, whom he married in 1940, was John Hudson's ex-wife, Dorothy Harvey. He called her Dorio to avoid confusion with his other wife, Dorothy Anthony, at least within their circle. But she is better known as Dorothy Hudson Hodel. So he married two Dorothys. At the same time? No, no, no. His oh. first wife was Dorothy Anthony, and then this so, one was... Uh, and they were already divorced at that point. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, Dorothy Anthony was the first, Dorothy Harvey was the second, so Dorio. Okay. Oh, it's a lot, Dor- Okay. Yep. Gonna have to keep track of this twisting web of drama and relationships. Okay. So, Hodel purchased Swoden House in 1945 and lived there from 1945 until 1950. The structure built in 1926 by Lloyd Wright, son of, you know, the noted American architect Frank Lloyd Wright, has since been registered as a Los Angeles historic landmark. Hodel was effectively a polygamist in the late 40s, and around the time of the deaths of Spalding and Short, Hodel was living with Dorio and their three children, including Stephen who would later make the case that his father was a murderer. His first legal wife, Dorothy Anthony, and their daughter, Tamara, would live with them at times, and his original common-law wife, Amelia, mother of Hodel's oldest child, by that time an adult, would also occasionally stay with them. He was also prone to taking temporary lovers while he was married, and multiple witnesses later suggested such a relationship between Hodel and Short. Hodel left the United States in March of 1950 for Hawaii, then a U.S. territory, where he married an upper-class Filipino woman, Hortoniza Laguada. After another four children with her, they divorced in the 60s, and she was later a member of the Philippine Congress as Hortoniza Stark. Hodel returned to the United States in 1990 and married legally for the fourth time to a woman in- named June in San Francisco where he remained there for the rest of his life, and he died in 1999 at the age of 91. So, kind of back to the murder. He wasn't only just suspected for the Black Dahlia murder. Hodel first came under suspicion for murder in 1945, following the death of his secretary, Ruth Spaulding, by drug overdose. He was suspected of having murdered her in order to cover up his financial fraud, such as billing patients for tests that were never performed to protect valuable secrets he had obtained about the police and politicians from their patients obtaining illegal abortions. At about this time, Hodel left briefly for China, where he worked with the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Administrations. These events first came to the public attention in 2004, after he had died. On January 15, 1947, the naked body of Elizabeth Short was discovered in an empty lot in Limerick Park in Los Angeles. Short uh we had talked about had suffered brutal mutilations notably her body being cut in half at the waist as well as her mouth being cut ear to ear the case had earned major publicity and prompted one of the largest investigations of the lapd and it was kind of suspected at the time and i didn't really get into this by the cutting from ear to ear and how she was drained of blood as well as how she was mutilated that they think someone with medical knowledge had had killed her by the way she was cut i had thought the same thing when you said like the body was empty of blood as well so like somebody who would have to have that kind of skill is like there's a limited amount of suspects that would have that like it couldn't just be anyone yeah so that that probably leans it more towards it could be someone in a medical background or in mortuary background yep 
So with that said, authorities at the time interviewed hundreds of suspects and narrowed on to 25 suspects whom Hodel was one of. And various aspects of the case had suggested a strong connection to surrealism as well, besides the medical knowledge, including works of Man Ray in particular, which George Hodel was known to love. In late 1949, Hodel's teenager daughter, Tamara, accused him of insexual sexual abuse and impregnating her, after which she received an abortion. He was acquitted after a widely publicized trial. There was, however, three witnesses present during and who participated in the sex acts. Two testified at trial, and the third recanted her earlier testimony and refused to come forward, the theory being that Hodel had threatened her into silence. The trial had caused Mar to look like a liar and who had fabricated the abuse allegation for attention. So it was also suspected that Hodel had either the judge or some of the jury in the back of his pocket. As like, you know. Sounds like it. I mean, if he's doing the same thing with politicians and cops, that seems to fit. Yeah. And there was like first account witnesses who said, I did this with Hodel. So uh-huh. that was... Yeah. Heart. Okay. Yep. Huh. So you can see why his son kind of hated him, too, if, like, that was going on with his sister and all this stuff. Kind of goes without saying. Yeah. Yeah. So Hodel came to police attention as a suspect in the short murder in 1949 after the sexual abuse trial. Known or suspected as sex criminals in the area were being investigated at first for the Black Dahlia trial because it was presumed that she had also been raped. Um, and it had come out in that trial that Tamar had allegedly claimed that her father was also the Black Dahlia killer. Hodel's medical degree also aroused suspicion given that the hypothesis whoever bisected Short's body had some degree of surgical skill and at least eight witnesses claimed firsthand knowledge of the 1946 relationship between Short and Hodel then back in Los Angeles and in China. Yeah, I don't see anything else kind of fit in that bill there. Yeah. So, and we will color or not color but we will cover other suspects but this is who i believe committed the black dahlia murder so i'm covering him first yeah it sounds like it yeah so the full details on the investigation came to light only in 2003 when a george hodel black dahlia file was discovered in the vault in los angeles county district attorney's office so this goes back to the part where the LAD, lapd was corrupt The file revealed that in 1950, Hodel was a prime suspect for the Dahlia murder. His private Hollywood residence was electronically bugged by an 18-man DALPD task force between February 15th and March 27th of 1950. Transcripts of conversations revealed Hodel's references to performing illegal abortions, as well as giving payoffs to law enforcement officials and to his possible involvement in the deaths of his secretary in short. The DA tapes recorded him saying, Supposing I did kill the Black Dahlia, they can't prove it now. They can't talk to my secretary anymore because she's dead. They thought there was something fishy. Anyway, now they may have figured it out. Killed her. Maybe I did kill my secretary too. Hodel was also interviewed as a suspect in the nearby June 1949 murder of Louise Springer, the Green Twig murder, though evidence to support this accusation was not publicly available until July of 2018, so much later. So, in October of 1949, Hodel's name was again mentioned in a formal written report to the grand jury as one of the five prime suspects in the short murder, but none of the named suspects were submitted to the grand jury for consideration for indictment as the investigation was still ongoing by April 1950. Jimson had gathered enough evidence to charge Hodel Hover and was about to arrest him for the short murder when Hodel again left the United States for Hawaii. He obtained a degree in uh, psychiatry and counseled prisoners in the territorial prison in Hawaii for three years, then moved on to the Philippines where he started a new family and appeared to remain there until 1990, finally dying in 1999 in San Francisco without charges ever being filed against him. However, like I said before, his son Steve had written and believes Hodel re-entered the United States multiple times each year from 1958 through er, through 88, specifically in the 66 to 69 Uh, years to commit more murders and then return to the Philippines thereafter where he could not be indicted. 
So, uh, just again saying, George Hodel makes the most sense to me, but there's going to be some other suspects for the Black Dahlia murder. Yeah, but I'm with you so far that that seems pretty straight up. Like this guy the, was the, all the sense, perfect guy. Yeah, he was all sense, so uh, sorts of messed up. Had the degree. Mm-hmm was really effed about his family and all the things he did and was just like a polygamist, a uh, very fishy plus, guy, doing I illegal mean, plus shit. Plus the, the tapes that essentially, like that would be pretty incriminating, saying that like, well, they can't prove anything now. And it, like my secretary's dead, so it's not like they could talk to her as if like she would know if that... Like, that would have been, like, a key witness, I guess. Yeah. And now they're gone. So, yeah, with you. That would be my prime suspect. And now, another word from our sponsors. Hey, guys. So, I have a really fun game to tell you guys about. It's called SherlockInYourHomes.com. That's S-H-E-R-L-O-C-K-I-N-Y-O-U-R-H-O-M-E-S.com. Now you guys are given a list of suspects and you can eliminate suspects and find the murder weapon by going through the rooms and solving puzzles and playing games. And it's so much fun. You guys can play as you go and you have 30 days to solve the murder or you guys could accept the challenge and see if you guys can beat John John and I's time on solving this murder mystery and do it correctly. So I've only had one sitting so far, but as soon as we do solve it, we'll post both Jaja and I's time on the website, and we want to see how many of you guys can beat us. So go to SherlockInYourHomes.com now to play the game and start today. Now, back to the show. Yep. So we're going to cover what I consider the other two main ones. Um, There's more on the list, but these guys make the most sense to me. Uh, Walter Bailey was a Los Angeles surgeon who lived one block south of the vacant lot where Elizabeth Short's body had been dumped. He'd moved from this location when he left his wife in October of 1946. During January 1947, Bailey's estranged wife was still living with him, and Bailey's daughter, Barbara Lindergren, was a friend of Elizabeth Short's sister, Virginia, and brother-in-law, Adrian West. Barbara had been the Matron of honor at Virginia and Adrian's wedding, so short sister's wedding. Bailey, however, died in January of 1948, and his autopsy showed that he had been suffering from a degenerative brain disease. Bailey's widow claimed Bailey's mistress, Dr. Alexandra Partica, had known a terrible secret about him, which is why he listed his mistress as the main beneficiary. So... The guy, the other suspect, who was a surgeon, died from a degenerative brain disease in 48, had a terrible secret, also had the medical knowledge. The LAPD never considered Bailey a suspect in the Black Dahlia case. However, many theorists believed he could be linked to Elizabeth Short in more ways than one uh, due to the man's medical expertise and Mm. his connections through Short's sister. Mm. Detective Harry Hansen told the 1949 grand jury that the killer had to be top medical man and a fine surgeon bailey was 67 years old at the time of elizabeth short's death and had no history of violence or criminal activity however he likely had not even known or met short even though his daughter was a friend of elizabeth short's sister so this is kind of how i'm eliminating him i guess like there's a connection but it is a distant one like it's a bit of a stretch yep with that Granted, the proximity to where the body was left was probably what? is the closest connection. Like, yep. much closer than that his daughter might have known her sister. Yeah. So, aside from that, plus, like, yes, pe- pe- lots of people just have secrets in general. I mean, if you had a mistress, obviously he has secrets. Yeah. So, to say that that one would have to be for sure that. Granted... A good side tangent to the TV show. I know, right? I think that would be a a nice just like, well, did this person do it? No. Well, maybe, well, well, did this person do it? I don't know. So another point is it's also believed that his neurological degeneration disease could have contributed to his violent ways against, against Elizabeth Short. He claimed that the neurological condition was also known to elicit violent behavior in otherwise calm individuals. 
the guy who had this theory called Harnish contacted Johnny Douglas, a retired FBI profile filer, to help devise this theory of him being a suspect. Douglas advised two things to Harnish. The first was that the public location dumping site had to have some significance to the killer, just because he could have easily dumped the victim's body privately. The vacant lot was only one block away from the property owned by Ruth Bailey, Walter Bailey's estranged wife. The second was that the f- facial lacerations indicated that the killer had some sort of personal anger towards the victim as well as medical knowledge. Elizabeth Short had a period of time where she would falsely tell others that she had a child who died of a tragic accident as well. Walter Bailey had a son who was struck by a car and killed when he was 11. The son's birthday was January 13th. Elizabeth Short's body was discovered on January 15th, shortly thereafter, and Harnish believed that Bailey could have been trying to compensate for his son's death. Short was known to exaggerate in her lifetime and everything, so that's kind of where this is coming from and how they kind of string together that this theory, besides the two connections, like the motive, I guess. And then some theories have suggested that the terrible secret Bailey's mistress knew was that Bailey had been performing, performing abortions on women which was a crime in the 40s. Hmm. However, there is no evidence of this being true. Yeah, that's kind of like what I was saying before. And yeah, there's a lot of close things there, but I wouldn't say that it is... I wouldn't say it's close enough to be considered like for sure that it's this guy. No. I think, yeah, it's still leading way more towards Odell. Yeah, considering him and Short had a relationship and Hodel was uh, sadomasochist and mm-hmm. all sorts of messed up. Like it checks more boxes there than it does here. Yep. The other suspect I have listed is Leslie Dillon. The 27-year-old Leslie D- Dillon worked as a bellhop and was an aspiring writer and had previously been a mortician's assistant. In October of 1948, Dillon wrote to the LAPD psychiatrist Dr. J. Paul D. River about the Black Dahlia case. Dylan, writing from Florida, told DeRiver that he had heard about Elizabeth Short's case from a True Detective magazine where DeRiver spoke on the case. He wanted to hear DeRiver's theories on the case just because he had an interest in sadism and sexual psychopaths and wanted to write a book on those subjects. Dylan never confessed to the murder. He instead claimed Jeff Connors, a friend of his, was Elizabeth Short's killer. As DeRiver and Dylan wrote back and forth from Florida to Los Angeles, D. Rivers started to believe that Connor was not a real man. He believed that Dylan himself had murdered Elizabeth Short and had developed Connor as a figment of his imagination to cope with the gruesome act. In December of 1948, Dylan agreed to meet D. River, and D. River offered three potential locations, Phoenix, Los Angeles, and Las Vegas. Dylan expressed reservations about Los Angeles and chose to meet River in Las Vegas instead. D. River and an undercover LAPD officer, Sergeant John O'Mara, met Dylan in Las Vegas. D. River interrogated Dylan and O'Mara acted as his bodyguard. D. River recorded his interviews with Dylan, and the following is one of the segments from these recordings. D. River, why do you think the killer did with what he did and shaved off the hair of the private parts of the body of Elizabeth Short? Dylan, I think the killer did as such as he would probably have thrown the hair in the toilet and flushed it. D. River, what do you think the killer as such would do with the piece of flesh and the tattoo, the piece of flesh with the tattoo after he cut it off her thigh? Dylan, well, I think he probably would have thrown that down the toilet and flushed it as well. So I, I don't get what he has with toilets and flushing stuff down there. But those were parts taken off of Short's body. I think... For from my perspective, those they were looking that perhaps he would say something like they'd be treated like trophies mm-hmm. and something that he would be keeping. And if he just flushed it down the toilet, then why would he remove them in the first place? So it's sort of like they were seeing if he knew what he was talking about. And it sounds sounds like they were kind of suspicious that yeah he could have been a potential suspect in that but it's like he he didn't actually have anything on it just like he had ideas from what he knew and for the most part most people didn't know what that was essentially the how that sort of worked back then or like how people would do things so that's why the undercover 
cop was there is more he was listening to make sure that this might have because it might be a false lead and it sounds like a, these questions would have made sure that they were or weren't yeah no that makes sense anyways another segment from a conversation de river you are the one who murdered elizabeth short dylan dr d river the trouble with this is that you first reach out on your own conclusions about this case and then you try to dig up things to prove that your conclusions are correct d river what do you think i am a child what do you mean by talking to me that way i'm a person who has been around the undercover officer also remembered Dylan talking about bleeding a body prior to embalming by making an incision on the upper thigh and inserting a tube to drain the blood. Dylan had his medical ex- experience when he worked as a mortician's assistant. So this is kind of where he gets more of a main one because, like, the blood was drained. It was cut in half. There is some medical knowledge here. Yeah. Well, I mean, I did mention it later, like, before that it would have to be someone with like medical experience or like a mortuary mortuary background type stuff so yeah like you said at the top of the episode yeah yeah and i'd say that like that may have kept them still suspicious and of course like the letters back and forth were probably pretty unsettling for rivers so he already did kind of have his own conclusions about these things yep so Dylan had hoped to return to California with Deerver and O'Mara to show them his friend Jeff Connors, the one who he blamed the Black Dahlia for. However, when they arrived to San Francisco, they searched for Jeff Connors, but had difficulty locating him. The LAPD then confronted Dylan, trapping him with the purpose of getting a confession out of him. Dylan eventually offered the police intimate details about Elizabeth Short's murder that the investigators had even struggled to explain. Dylan had been held against his will at a hotel near Los Angeles and had been not denied his constitutional rights, however. An undercover officer handcuffed Dylan and officially took him into custody at the Highland Park Station on January 10, 1949. Detectives Finnis Brown and Harry Hansen questioned Dylan in the evening of January 10th. The following night, January 11th, the LAPD received a call from San Francisco police saying that they had found Jeff Connors. His real name was Artie Lane. Lane had lived in Los Angeles at the time of Elizabeth Short's murder and worked as a maintenance man in Columbia Studios, a favorite hangout place for Elizabeth. There had been speculation that Artie Lane and Leslie Dillon could have been the same man. The LAPD never confirmed this theory, however, and by the end of 1949, Finnis Brown was no longer interested in Dillon. The LAPD concluded that Dillon was most likely in San Francisco when the murder took place. However, they could not conclusively place him there. In fact, the police could not account for Dylan's whereabouts between January 9th and January 15th of 1947, the days when Elizabeth Short had still been considered missing. Dylan later filed a $100,000 claim against the city of Los Angeles for how he was treated illegally uh, detained, yet the lawsuit was dropped when the LAPD discovered that he was wanted by the Santa Monica police for robbing a hotel while working as a bellhop there. The scandal around Dylan and D. Rivers' involvement in the Black Dahlia investigation aided a triggering 1949 grand jury investigation into Elizabeth's short case and police cover up in the correction the corruption in Los Angeles. So this suspect, though, like never really proved anything, was probably my second most leaning towards. Mm-hmm. But it did expose the police corruption and everything. And I'm still thinking George Hodel was it, and this guy was just yeah. sick in the mind. Yeah, I mean, there are murder fanboys out there that, I mean, they get letters all the time about a bunch of stuff like that. I mean, it's gross. Yeah. But still, it's just, yeah. I think this guy just, like, really liked that stuff, but didn't want to do it himself. Yep. And, I don't know. He was just piecing together stuff that was there, and he put a lot of thought into it. As a bellhop, I'm assuming you don't have a lot of hard mental challenges. No. So, still though, he would be my number two. Yeah, I I agree with that. Um, so just to kind of recap here, George Hodel. Uh, probably killed the secretary short and then that twig yes that tree twig thing 
Yes. Yeah. But, like, that's serial killer where everybody else would have been just a single murder. Yeah. And, and Hodel had the influence over the town, the city, a couple judges, high influencer people. Like, he mm-hmm. had the means and connections to get away with it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. I I don't know about you guys listening, but to me it is, I'd say Hodel without a doubt. Yeah. I, I agree with you. Mm-hmm. Now, you are you may be wondering about the rabbit holes I mentioned at the earlier <laughs> part of the episode and everything. A little. I'm, a, I'm thinking, though. Let me guess. Let me guess. It is in connections to police corruption in L.A. Well, that's already confirmed with this, so no. Oh, well, like, I don't know. I was thinking that, like, there were more cases that were covered up by the police so that's where i i guess wrong okay what is it so it i found a website however legitimate it is that sent me on a rabbit hole of several different prolific serial killers not only the black dahlia but the zodiac killers the sweetheart murders and the lipstick murders so kind of teaser for next week we are covering the actual serial killer for one of those cases. Ooh. And you guys get to have, or you guys have to come back to figure out which one we're covering. But oh. this one website claims he did them all. But I, uh, it, it, my opinion. It's, and, it's at least worth a listen. If it's going to be a rabbit hole that connects everything, I want to hear it. Yes. Yes. So next, ne- next week's episode may be a little bit weird and different because I'm going down the rabbit hole of how I researched this case and then actually covering the case. So oh, Okay. I like it. Yeah. It'll be really, really interesting. And this case does come up in next week's case. All right. So that is all I have for this week. Oh, wonderful. Shall I take us out? Yeah. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, please give us five stars, leave a review, and subscribe to our podcast. We'd love to hear from you, and if you feel the urge to do so, you could either do that through writing a review or by emailing us at vileandvice at gmail.com, as well as leaving a comment or something along those lines, suggestions for new episodes, you could do so. I have both that email, but also on our Facebook at Vile and Vice Podcast, as well as on Instagram, also at Vile and Vice Podcast. Or just give us a quick, quick suggestion or be like, yo, what's up? That was an awesome episode. You could do so at Twitter as well at Vile and Vice. And again, in all of these, it is spelled A N D. No ampersands here with this stuff because we're dedicating to that super hard. And if you like supporting us, you can do so at Patreon with patreon.com slash vile and vice again no ampersands or maybe a one-time payment with a paypal at the vile and vice gmail.com we love hearing from you if you feel the urge to do so please do so it's brought us much joy and let us know your times with the sherlock in your homes game because i'm curious yeah this this is gonna be a complicated one audie yeah all righty Well, that's all from us. We'll see you next week. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to Violin Vice. Cover art is by Audie Griffith. Music by Annabelle Rivack. If you want to help support the show, please visit patreon.com slash violinvice. Or give us five stars on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to. This helps us move up the charts and also helps keep the spooky stories coming. Thank you.